FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is November 14th, 2017. Well, person you're about to hear from, heard from before, he says that uh, perhaps a new advance for gold and silver uh, started on November 6th. What's going to be the impact on bonds, stocks, dollar, gold? And what about the 90-10 rule focused on late 17, early 18. Well, I can't find, can't wait to hear more about it. First, join the show, email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, any questions or comments. And don't forget the Twitter feed, at Kerry Lutz. So without further ado, Eric Haddock is with us now. Eric, welcome back. Oh, thanks for having me back, Kerry. Of course. So what is the 90-10 rule? The 90-10 rule is a kind of a simple way of describing parabolic moves in the market. And I've seen it so consistently that I can't really ignore it. And within the scope of the cycles that I that I monitor and that I've seen um, very consistently govern a lot of these markets, very often and particularly in gold and silver and uh, also in stock indices, both of those markets tend to do it even more than others. But you will see 80 to 90 percent of an entire move, uh, whatever move is is unfolding within that cycle. So it's all you got to have context and certain proportions. But often, eighty to ninety percent of that move occurs during the last ten to twenty percent of the cycle. So you know, sometimes I've referred to it as eighty twenty rule, which is a very common right. uh, principle that, that people in business and everything else know. But uh, you know, in, in recent years. Uh, it has become much more the 90-10 rule where you get such big moves in the very final days or weeks of a particular cycle. Uh, A perfect example was back in 2015. And the the stock indices uh, since late 2014, I had been describing a pattern that hit the markets during the middle half of the year. And based on this uh, 17-year cycle that I watch very uh, consistently in the markets and some corroborating cycles, uh, I was looking for a a decent correction in the middle half of the year. And I identified that as from April through October, uh, excuse me, April through August, uh, possibly stretching into late September. So it ended up being a five-month period that I was really watching for a 10 to 20 percent correction in um, most stocks and many of the indices. And so you saw different indexes top out at different times, uh, really stretching from April through June. And that was not just domestic indexes, but also around the globe. And really the one that kind of keyed that drop was uh, in China, Shanghai Composite and their entire equity market. But you saw this this topping phase from April through June, then kind of this rolling over phase where you get some uh, successively lower highs occurring in July and even early August. And then all of a sudden uh, from about August 8th to the 10th until the 24th, you saw almost the entire decline of what occurred in that context, in that five-month cycle. Uh, About 90% of it, from a price perspective, occurred during the final 10% 10 of that cycle. So that five-month cycle, about half a month roughly, and 90% of the move to the downside occurred during that 10%. And it's like I said, it's a way of expressing a parabolic move, a a blow off in in a lot of the markets, but you've just seen it become so consistent in markets like precious metals and in equities that uh, it's, you know, in so many forces are trying to, in the case of stock market, keep it up, up, up. And then all of a sudden when it finally 
when they throw in the towel, they do it all at once and boom, you have this washout and then it's over. Uh, you've seen same thing to the upside in precious metals uh, over the course of particularly the last couple of years as we're starting to go through a bottoming phase. But then if you even go back prior to the 2011 peak, you saw much of the same thing in precious metals when they would have a, a cycle, whether that be a six to 12 months, something in that um, parameter and and 90% of an up move would happen in the last um, month or so. And again, scaling to whatever cycle you're talking about. So that is what I was talking about as far as precious metals, uh, taking that to, to the present uh, application to it. Um, I have been looking for a couple of different cycles in precious metals to peak in the first quarter of 2018. Now, it doesn't mean a final top. That's just, again, in this, in this context. Um, and one of those cycles was a move from a mid-2017 low up to a first quarter 2018 high. And so one of part of my thinking has been that a lot of that move to the upside, if things unfold the way I'm expecting, and if they adhere to this 90-10 rule again, that a lot of that up move will still wait until the first quarter of, of 2018. And between mid-2017 and that first quarter 2018, and, and there's monthly and weekly cycles now starting to hone that to a more specific time frame. But in that, in the meantime, you get just a lot of bottoming phase where you'll get a low and you'll get a sometimes struggled rally and a quick pullback, but you get a series of ascending lows. So that's one thing you definitely need to see to corroborate that is that the, the previous cycle low is not taken out. And you just get this entire, um, what, what Elliott Wave kind of looks at as a one, two, one, two, one, two pattern, where on progressively smaller magnitudes, starting out with the largest magnitude, uh, one wave advance, followed by a two wave pullback, then as that bigger degree, larger degree third wave starts to unfold, it breaks down into a moderate degree first wave up, second wave down. And then as that moderate third wave begins, it breaks down into a first and second wave. So you get this um, kind of stair step um, pattern going on. And the highs don't always take out the previous highs, but the lows should definitely be higher than the previous lows. And then all of a sudden, it's when you enter that third of third of third wave, the upside is when you get your dynamic, more accelerated move. And again, that's where this 90-10 rule really applies the most. So, so it's more important than you're there early, even though you're going to have to wait around a while, because when it does move, it moves in a manner that it's going to be too late once you realize it. It, it, certainly, if that is the type of trading you're doing, um, it, from my perspective, I'm often looking to waiting for those uh, dynamic moves and letting them set up, you know, take gold, for instance, that on a, a multi-year basis, it's been doing this bottoming process since late 2015. And and so if if that's all you're looking at is to just kind of buy and hold through the through the entire cycle, the entire trend, then absolutely. But if you're looking to make your money work for you and where you want it, where it's going to have the, the best potential at any given time, um, I have specific indicators that I look for to tell me that, OK, now we're getting we're starting to. Uh, show multiple signs of, of rolling over to the upside. And now it's time to start getting in. But in the meantime, uh, be involved in other markets that are in that same phase themselves. So um, my, my approach to the market, a little different than, than what you're describing, but certainly for your um, gold and silver holders, uh, that would that would be the case. You wouldn't want to wait to the last minute and try to time the exact uh, acceleration point. Right. So, yeah, I guess uh, timing is difficult business, even for professionals. For non-professionals, it's all but impossible. So what we're seeing here, what about the uh, stock indices? Uh, they're going to just keep going up 
uh, indefinitely here? Or are we getting to the final chapter? That certainly seems to be the the mentality out there that uh, there there is no stopping it. Um, but there again, there's a couple applications of this um, 90-10 rule, and I, and I just use that as a kind of a backdrop, a, a, a governing um, foundation for then applying more specific technicals and cycles. In fact, all of my cycle work, I I really stress to readers and traders that you don't try and trade specifically or independently off these cycles. They're giving you the backdrop. They're giving you timing of when to look for certain indicators. But I want to take it down to a, a more specific, more practical, more objective standpoint. And that's why I have specific technical indicators that I look for to validate those cycles. And again, to tell me when the accelerated part is far more likely. And with stock indices, there's been two overriding cycles that I've been looking at for 2017, 2018. Uh, one of them is was looking for a uh, topping phase and and should should wait until uh, second quarter of 2018 to see a corresponding low. Uh, a more a little bit narrower one. Uh, I was looking at the July through November time frame as being a little bit like that April through August 2015 time frame, where uh, when you talk about the decennial cycle, which is a pretty commonly or readily known uh, cycle in the market, where stocks often set a um, a one to two year or longer top during the seven year of the decade and see a pretty significant and I'd say at least 15 to 20 percent, uh, often more than that, correction into the eight year. Now, from just a general standpoint, you know, you could argue that could make um, the market could wait until December 31st of 2017 to peak and, and drop all the way into December 31st of 2018. But uh, from a more consistent basis, you've often seen the first leg of that decline happened during the July through November time frame. And here again, if we're looking at a five month, roughly five month period like that, similar to April through August of 2015, you could see the lion's share of a corresponding sell off in the final couple of weeks of that five month cycle, which would tell you the, the second half of November. So I'm certainly looking for some signs on an intermediate basis to see a a decent drop here and a, a bit of a correction that that starts to shake some some investors' confidence in the never-ending bull market. <laughs> and kind of going along with that, the the index that has historically, at least over the last 20 years, historically led. Um, most of the declines in the overall equity markets has been the Dow transportation average. And you go back to when it peaked in mid-1999 and the rest of the indexes really didn't peak till early 2000. Uh, same thing happened at the 2007 peak where the transports topped out earlier. And even on some one to two year basis, that has, that has happened uh, consistently as well. And lo and behold, you've got the the transports peaked in mid October, and they've been heading lower ever since. And they're right on the cusp of turning their weekly trend down, which is the the primary indicator I look to uh, in, to confirm to me that a multi month top is is in place. And it's a it's more of a lagging confirming indicator. It's not something that tells you when to um, initially uh, get on the, the short side or get out of the long side. But once you've had other preliminary indicators tell you that this weekly trend indicator is what I use to tell me, okay, we've we've confirmed that that peak that should not be taken out for at least a few months. And in the case of the Dow Transport, it would now take a weekly close. So November 17th is the, the first uh, possibility for that. 
a weekly close below 94.80 in the transports, and that would turn my weekly trend indicator down, confirm that we've we're putting in a multi-month top. And also that's what I think would start to um, see some reverberations through the the other indexes. And it's also interesting to me that just in the last week or so, if you look at most of the European indexes, they've taken a pretty significant hit on an intermediate basis. Uh, so I, I'm certainly watching to see if the Dow Industrials, the S&P, and the NASDAQ are going to follow suit and, and see some profit taking in here, or if they're going to continue to go it alone and uh, and drive to new highs. There, there's some daily trend indicators I'm watching there that are close to reversing down, but have not yet uh, confirmed a what would be a multi-week top in those indexes. So for now, we just have to watch, wait, and see. Now, reading your la latest newsletter, uh, and you'd made this prediction a while ago of some type of turbulence in the Middle East, and you said that prices in oil pretty much uh, reached their low, they were going to go higher from there, and then you made this forecast in the latest newsletter where you said that there's going to be this turbulence in the Middle East and that somehow at a later date they're going to unify. Can you just elaborate on that a bit more? Well, yeah, that that's uh, some very long-term geopolitical, uh, cultural, civilization type cycles and research that I have uh, done over the last 20 plus years. And one of the conclusions that I drew about a decade or so ago was that uh, I thought you would see a, a successful attempt at a Middle East union uh, coming into play between 2018 and 2021. Um, so, you know, back in the 2000s and, and early 2010s, uh, that was still way out on the horizon. Uh, but one of the um, corroborating indicators I thought we would see, for, again, from a multi-century, even multi-millennial cycle standpoint, uh, one of the corroborations I was looking for uh, upheaval in the Middle East in 2010-2011, and I had done a series of articles back in 2008 through 2010 describing this and linking it back to cycles that went back to um, the, the late or the early 1000s um, and battles in the Middle East uh, that, that were, were part of the Crusades and, and ultimately um, the, the battle for uh, Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and these cycles to me told me that we would see uh, the, the first phase of this would be upheaval in the Middle East starting in 2010, 2011 and that you would then see a kind of a new phase of, of upheaval and, and then that that would ultimately lead to a, a union uh, by the year 2021. So when we saw the Arab Spring take hold in late 2010 and early 2011, it was certainly a, a validating factor but again, that was very long term and, and much more general type of cycle analysis. But uh, as soon as I saw that, I started um, reiterating the focus on 2018 to 2021. And you even look back over the last 50, 60, 70 years, there have been multiple attempts. Often it's just two or three nations um, and even some um, fragile unions that did hold for a year or two, a uh, few years. Uh, but I think you're going to see something more significant uh, come start to evolve over the next couple of years and, and reach fruition by 2021. Uh, but then taking that down to some more multi-year and multi-decade instead of centuries and millenniums, millennia. Um, I was looking at late 2017 to late 2018 to be kind of a um, an intensification uh, cycle, uh, also focused on Israel and the Middle East, uh, but also their their role along with other uh, Arab nations. Um, 
And so one of the things that's interesting to me was just how you um, you heard of this um, somewhat clandestine meeting between uh, Israel and uh, Saudi Arabian yeah. prince uh, at that time, and that uh, and that shortly after that was also when this same prince is starting to do a very serious purge throughout Saudi Arabia, and there's kind of speculation about whether this is um, targeted, ultimately targeted towards Iran, that that's kind of um, one thing Israel and Saudi Arabia have in common is a common enemy uh, in Iran. And and even when you uh, deal with some of the um, conflict with Hezbollah and uh, even what's going on in Lebanon now, and, you know, it's pretty much uh, assumed or concluded that that Iran backs Hezbollah, and and so it's it's you're starting to see just a couple of these blips on the radar uh, of of what these long term cycles are indicating. So it's I'm looking to see if if these events have any staying power to them if they start to um, uh, kind of gel and, and solidify into something more. Uh, but I'm not saying that this is the um, the Middle East unification that I'm looking for. I think this is is the start of some of the uh, con- a new phase of conflict and turmoil you're going to see before that unification takes hold. Well, that's quite a call. And you have to wonder, because it appears that Saudi Arabia and Iran are on the brink of war right now. Uh, there's been a lot of attacks, y- a proxy war in Yemen, and they're ratcheting up the hostility. And then you see the uh, new crown prince, well, he let his father do the dirty work, lock up all the potential adversaries. Now he's in charge, and merrily ahead they go. Uh, <laughs> what's going to happen here in the end? I mean, uh, well, and you even had that even had that uh, rocket or missile yeah. uh, intercepted heading to Riyadh a, a couple weeks ago. Exactly out of um, was that of Yemen right, or out of or, Yemen. It was out of Yemen. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So that's like you say. That certainly is is getting uh, more serious. It's not just the, um, uh, the 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 rhetoric or the um, you know saber rattling mm. that we've often seen in the past it's it's starting to materialize into something yeah and there's always discord among islam uh, they spend more time fighting each other than fighting uh, israel or anyone else and yeah when you mentioned the prior attempts at unification before you had the united arab republic which was between syria and egypt and I don't remember, there was one other country, but they've tried that a couple of times. And thus far, it's uh, been condemned to failure. But uh, you have to wonder if, if there's going to be a unification, that means a major uh, realignment of everything in the Middle East, right? Well, and, you know, I don't claim to to know the <laughs> exact structure or even close to that. <laughs> I'm just talking about, like I said, the, these very general uh, cycles. So yeah. then, you know, with, with bigger things like this, you keep taking it down to the next level, next level, next level, and and start to, um, you know, that, that skeleton starts to take on a little bit of shape and a little bit of flesh fills in, um, and, and the markets are often a such a harbinger of that too and and give a lot of the um early warning signs and you know when when oil cycles um projected a major bottom in early 2016 um even that i was saying that we had to have a about an 18 month bottoming process um before just from a purely market and technical standpoint, that you don't go from a, a major decline to a major advance um, right at the drop of a dime or, you know, just turn on, turn on a dime and, um, and enter an opposing trend. There's usually a, a big 
um, consolidation, lick the wounds, or, you know, try to pick yourselves up and, and reform uh, whatever it is that, that needs to reform to, to start a new bull market. But not only from a technical price perspective, was that telling me to look for a series of some um, ascending lows into the middle half of 2017 and then the third quarter be when you start to angle a little higher in, uh, in those progressive lows on, on the price charts. But it also fit perfectly with these uh, some of the more specific Middle East cycles that I was looking for to start to kick in between September 2017 and September 2018. Um, so it, it it fit together nicely, and the price action was corroborating it. And so we're we're seeing at least the early stages of that. And like I said, it's it's now um, starting to see some of the this that form take shape and and start looking for other indications of of which specific direction it's going to go over the over the coming years yeah so so it's definitely something you want to be paying attention to it's got to affect the price of oil here at some point although seemingly uh, the price of oil has moved against the fundamentals at least as we perceive them for quite some time now hasn't it well, I'm not sure what you'd be referring to be, by then, because when you talk about the the glut of oil that really drove prices down, and even going back a year ago, mm. when OPEC finally announced some cuts and finally got Russia on board, I was talking about it back then, that you really have to get past the the headlines and and kind of discern exactly what they're talking about. And at the time, in September, October of 2016, Russia had been able to ramp their production up to almost unprecedented highs. Um, and so then, when they finally got to you know that that peak capacity, then they agreed to. Um, to, to freeze production. Um, or, and I don't even recall if they came on board with any cuts, but it was just this, okay, we'll freeze. In other words, we've now gotten as high as we can. We're right. going to continue cranking <laughs> out the same production, but yeah. let's tell the world that we're freezing production and see if that bumps up the price of oil. Yeah. And, you know, it was very short lived. You had a little pop during the talk. And then end of November last year, you had the meeting, you had the cuts come into play with Saudi Arabia and some of the other OPEC nations. But it was a classic buy the rumor, sell the fact um, that, that you right. had the anticipation going into it. You had some positive news and anticipation. But when the, then when the reality hit, there was nothing to drive the price any higher. And consequently, it actually started to roll over and, and fell off again into uh, the first and second quarter of this year. So I think that the, the price action has been very in tune with the fundamentals, which are still um, a lot of supply. And and so the the perceived or the kind of marketed and spun fundamentals really weren't what it was being made to sound like. Uh, and so it's taken this long for crude to uh, really trace out that that bottoming process. And now it's getting into the phase where it starts to see a little bit uh, more convincing uptrends and the subsequent pullbacks should be of a uh, slightly lesser magnitude so that you kind of have a not only ascending lows, but that the angle of each pair of ascending lows starts to increase. Um, and so you just, again, it's it's this, you know, whether you talk about a, a saucer type pattern that then starts to go into not necessarily a parabola, but more of an uptrend, uh, that's what you see on, on the price charts with these uh, successive lows and highs. Yeah, I just meant as far as the fundamentals from the geopolitical standpoint, if you were just concentrating on them, it appeared that oil was destined to go higher, but yet it just shows how bad the fundamentals were from the supply standpoint uh, that it continued to go down nonetheless, right? It just uh, kept yeah, and, getting. 
And that's almost what, what you're describing is almost another application to me of this kind of 80, 20, 90, 10 rule. And, and what I mean by that is you see all this various saber rattling or, or a, a destabilization and, and the market's kind of the first time they react a little bit and then the second time a little less. And you know, by the third and fourth time they're yawning, but really there is, you know, an underlying problem that, that's festering and that's, that's mm. taking hold. Uh, a similar thing is like between the U.S. and North Korea. You know, right. during the first um, Twitter war, saber rattling, there was a bit more reaction in the equity markets and the dollar. Second time, a little bit less. Third time. Now, you know, they could be threatening almost the, the most extreme things and and the markets don't even look at it, but yet you know there still is um, a a trend there in the fundamental events or in the geopolitical events, and but it's not going to be till that proverbial last straw that all of a sudden um, everything reacts at once, mm -hmm. and you see a move that that should have been unfolding over a six month period suddenly occurs in a six day period. And so it's that same, it's just how the markets have become so desensitized to a lot of things and, and so often so supported or suppressed, depending on which market, uh, by, by the forces that, the powers that be, um, until there's too much that they just can't hold back, um, you know, right. the, the dam or the, the um, it all it all happens at once, and and the markets all react at once instead of phasing in some of that uh, uncertainty along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so they uh, it's best to ignore until you have to deal with it. I guess <laughs> that's been the attitudes of the markets for forever. It seems like Eric, you know, it just goes on and on and on. Well, and I think even the ability to um, to execute trades on a, you know, split second basis, uh, probably um, creates a, a sense of security, uh, lulls certain traders into a, into a sense of apathy uh, where they figure, okay, you know, if something happens in the Middle East, well, you know, within seconds, I'll be able to get out or get into appropriate <laughs> positions. Uh, and to some extent, that's that's true, but it's also, you know, what price you're getting in and out of, depending on how fast the market's moving. Right. Uh, but I think it's it's a function of that as well. Agreed. Yeah. And and uh, it never it, those escape plans never quite uh, work out the way you were hoping, at least has been my experience just watching people evacuate hurricane zones who been planning for it for years and yet it just doesn't quite work the way you expected there's always a glitch there's always something you didn't think of and you have to deal with it somehow and i think that's what they're going to have to deal with when they finally decide uh, that it's time to beat a hasty retreat right yeah it's always beautiful and sterile in theory and then you get to the uh, the messiness of reality and then like you said it's it's always much different than than all the planning had anticipated yeah amazing well hey eric uh, one other thing we'll just cover the dollar uh latest uh, expectations there well, that really fits into everything we've talked about up to this point. Uh, from a long-term basis, I was talking about late 2016, early 2017 to be a, a multi-year top. Um, but the the first overall uh, phase of a of a decline, I thought, would stretch into second quarter of 2018. And, and we saw the initial leg down from January into September, uh, then a bit of a bounce. Now the dollar is starting to show um, a topping formation. And so I think that we're getting ready to enter that uh, next leg down. 
And the thing to me, here's one other principle. I'll try to make this quick. Um, sure. One other principle that kind of goes along with that 90-10 rule is I call it the axiom of market correlation. And that often traders try to uh, trade one market and correlate it to another, you know, mm -hmm. or not even necessarily market to market, but it could be market to specific fundamentals like you're talking about with geopolitical uncertainty. Oh, well, that, that's always bullish for gold. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> and um, and so even certain market to market. Oh well, anytime the um, you know the stock market drops, gold goes up, or when uh, or vice versa. And the thing is that those correlations typically only work, at least with some real consistency and reliability. They only work during the extreme or the parabolic moves in whatever is the lead market. So if in the case of the dollar, if you're thinking that, oh, dollar down, gold up, dollar up, gold down, well, that's not the case either on a consistent basis. Um, but when you see um, the dollar reach an extreme level or go into an accelerated move, that's when I think gold is really going to pop. So in this case, we're talking about the dollar to the downside. And putting it into context, I'm talking about um, when I say extreme, uh, it'd be extreme on a two to three year basis right now. I'm not looking at the the real big um, 10 or 20 year trends and cycles, but I think that when the dollar breaks below those uh, September lows, that will, number one, tell a lot of traders, okay, uh, this is a, a higher magnitude dollar decline, a more serious correction. Um, Something, something's awry here that we're going to have to be more concerned with. It's also likely where you'll see a more accelerated move down in the dollar since you probably have a lot of support perceived around those lows, a lot of sell stops for uh, longs that have been put on since then. And it will also be something that now the dollar, instead of setting new six to 12 months and new one to two year lows, it could be setting new three to five year lows at that point. So all of a sudden you've increased the magnitude of, of what's happening. And I think that when the dollar does that, that's when you're going to see all of this kind of kick in. And, and I'm looking at either the very end of this year or the first uh, month or two of 2018 for when the dollar uh, could get back down and, and ultimately break below those lows. And I think that's when you'll see gold start to pay more attention and see more um, sustained up moves. And I also think that's when the stock market could start to just get a little bit more destabilized uh, and maybe see a little bit more follow through on on corrections. So it's kind of that 90-10 rule uh, overlapped with these uh, market correlations. It's all really describing the same thing from different angles. But I think that the, the dollar has a another leg down here on a three to six month basis. And I think that um, that could certainly coincide with and possibly be the trigger for, it depends on whether the cart's leading the horse at that point in time or vice versa, whether the horse is leading the cart. Uh, but, but the one other thing I would say too is all of that technical and cyclical analysis also has me wondering is there a fundamental event on the horizon that would trigger moves like that? And, you know, I even look at our own political structure here in America. And, you know, could that be the timing when some of these investigations uh, start to really um, result in, in something more serious than they have up to this point? Uh, could that create some uncertainty across the market? Or could it be something completely different? The, the fundamentals often don't show themselves until uh, well along into a trend. Uh, but but that's just one of those things I'm kind of monitoring, too, on my radar. Yeah, very true. Well, uh, in any event, it sounds like there's a lot of interesting events ahead of us here. Uh, paying particular attention to the Middle East, but the markets uh, have just acted in such a way that you have to wonder if there's going to be a reaction. Anyway, Eric, it's always great to have you on. We want to find out more about you. Uh, which sites do we go to? 
You can go to InsideTrack.com with the extra I in the middle, I-N-S-I-I-D-E-T-R-A-C-K.com. And also to 40-year cycle, the numbers 40, and in the words year cycle, uh, dot com for uh, a lot of the articles and, um, and posts and publications that uh, have really focused on uh, the 40-year cycle that I see being in a major transition phase from 2017 to 2021. All right. Well, Eric, it's going to be interesting to see. Thanks again for being with us. And we'll we'll check in with you probably right after the first of the year. Sounds great, uh, Kerry. Thanks for having me back. Oh, and by the way, uh, just be part of the show. Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Eric, we'll talk to you again real soon. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.